Hey what's up everybody, Trovenet here and welcome back to a special episode of Gwentage. Gwent is full of amazing artwork and I wanted to make a video that highlights this a little again. The artists working on this game earn all the praise they get for their vibrant and gorgeous set pieces contained in every single card. In today's video we will be looking closely at a few cards and look at 5 more things you might have missed in Gwent cards. Some of these will be familiar to some of you, but I hope you discover a few new things about the art within these beautiful cards because of this video. Let's dive in. Let's start with a fairly simple one concerning our favorite bloody mistress. In Thronebreaker, Gurney Korra is the main antagonist in the Angren chapter of the game, and although you only meet her near the end of the area, her influence is felt throughout your slog through the marches. Worshipping locals, curses and illnesses, Soldiers getting paranoid, deserting or even dying in excruciating pain or swallowed whole by one of the many monsters inhabiting the swamp. And all of the twisted trees dotting the marshes are covered in big red leeches. Gurnikora's Fruit In Gwent, Gurnikora's Fruit is one of the more unique leader abilities. As long as there's not yet one on the board, you can spawn a fruit or leech on your side of the board. This makes it seem that Gurney Korra is in control of them, but if the legend is to be believed, that might not be the case. See, there's two versions of her origin story. According to the elves, she's a fallen goddess, clean and simple. The local legend, however, is far more interesting. According to the people of Angren, Gurney Korra was a princess who drowned in the bogs on the way to her wedding together with her entire retinue. She managed to hold on to a branch, but was overrun by hundreds of leeches that sucked her dry. Her fear and revulsion was so powerful that her spirit remained and caused her body to live on, eternally bound to the swamp and being fed on by the same leeches that led to her death. The Gurnikora's fruit card seems to be just showing us a few of the leeches crawling on a rock at first glance. But look closer and you can actually see blood trickling down from the wounds they are inflicting on their apparent victim. Look even closer and you can identify their prey, Gurnikora herself. Her greyed out flesh constantly being torn and bled dry to feed the ever-growing swarm of leeches. Makes you think about who's really in control here, her or the leeches. But on to more happier places. Artorius Vigo is a pretty unknown character for both people who read the books as well as those who played the games. The Netflix show changed this by fleshing out a bit of backstory for Yennefer and at the same time introducing a lot of the older mages predating both the books and the games. Artorius was a powerful mage who specialized in illusions. His niece, the better known Fragilla, followed in his footsteps. What's more important for today's video, however, is his allegiance and skills. Artorius was mainly a court mage in Toussaint and coupled with his exceptional aptitude for illusions, he created an absolute masterpiece for the young duchesses under his care, Anna Henrietta and Sienna. Anyone who's played the Blood and Wine expansion to The Witcher 3 might be familiar with his work. He's the creator of The Land of a Thousand Fables. It's a small fact that is never really talked about during the DLC, but is mentioned in a few lore entries. The Gwent card for Artorius is therefore a loving rendering of the mage during the creation of the illusory land of fairy tales, showing him as an architect, surrounded by the three piglets, the frog prince and the iconic giant mushrooms littering the place, while he's currently inspecting a schematic for the next building he needs to erect in this wondrous world. It's a cool way of honoring the in-world mastermind of one of the coolest levels in the game who didn't get enough recognition in the first place. To make certain cards more impressive and awe-inspiring, the artists of Gwent often exaggerate the size of creatures or objects. They do this often so craftily, however, that you rarely notice the disproportions at first. The most subtle example of this is the Siege Tower. The biggest siege towers in history were around 40 meters or 130 feet high, which seems to match the siege tower we see here. The difference, however, is that those siege towers had 9 floors, while this one only has 5. The artists suddenly increased the height of each floor and probably also the height of the castle walls to make them seem monumental compared to the relatively small soldiers in the scene. This same trick is performed on a few other cards. 
Saison Tessis dwarfs everything else on her card. A castle tower crumbles underneath her claws, her wings seem to block the entire sky and the soldiers falling down seem to be nothing more than ants compared to the humongous dragon dominating the scene. Compare that to her appearance in The Witcher 2 however and you can clearly see that her head is supposed to be about the same height as Geralt in total. She's still an impressive creature but only possesses a fraction of the size she has on her Gwent card. The biggest example of exaggerated size in Gwent however is Kaeron. The artist of this card admits as much in the official Gwent art book and I quote The creature Geralt faced in The Witcher 2 was not nearly this big. On the Gwent card I drew it huge, sign of the times. The soldiers in the foreground make it seem like it is smaller than it actually is at first. Then you move your attention to the gulls flying in the background, barely noticeable in the distance but still in front of the colossal creature. To top it off, atmospheric perspective, a trick where objects further away start to take on the color of the sky, is also used in full to put the creature far away in the scene, reinforcing its massive size since it is still dominating the card, despite being quite far away. A masterclass in composition. But back to Thronebreaker, more specifically its protagonist Queen Meave of Lyria and Rivia. A charismatic and strong leader for sure and over the course of the game you can collect different weapons for her, doubling as leader abilities. The first few you come across are nothing particular. A longsword, a warhammer, a broadsword. Pretty basic weaponry. As the game goes on, these become more ornate and unique however. But did you know that almost all of Meave's weapons are featured in their own card in Gwent as well? The flail Meave can use is identical to the bloody flail card, which has changed its ability quite a few times over the course of Gwent's history, but is still in the game. You can spot the same faces on the flail that Meave carries on her card. Meave's spear, which she can get by the end of Thronebreaker, is very similar to the Mastercrafted spear. Same shape, same design, only the color of the attached cloth was changed from red to blue. Meave's Granny blade is identical to the original Elven blade card, a card that has since disappeared from Gwent but still serves as kind of an inspiration, bearing a similar design to the Enshade Saber Stratagem card added in Merchants of Ophir. Meave's Sihil is an exact copy of the Sihil card in Gwent, frozen and stuck into the ground, left by Meave at a later time in history maybe? Even the ornamental sword is based on an older Gwent card where it is shown in its original place stuck to a shield and used as a wall decoration. They're all really cool easter eggs. A nice reward for anyone paying attention during Meave's journey. Let's end with a fun one while still sticking to Thronebreaker. Remember Barnabas Beckenbauer? The quippy gnome inventor you can rescue in Mahakam from being kicked off a mountain in a barrel? He has some really funny conversations with Meave if you talk to him in the mess tent and one that a lot of players might remember is this particular proposal of his towards Meave. Novigrad lived there a spell as well, but I didn't much care for it. Why ever not? The Hierarch, intractable man, banned one of my inventions, condemned it as unholy, vile, etc, etc. Decided he would burn both of us at the stake. As you can imagine, we had a difference of opinion in that regard. Perhaps I shall regret this, but do tell. What was the thing you created exactly? <laughs> I knew you'd be interested. You've a curious mind, dear Queen. We're two peas of a feather. Quite the clever contraption it was. Made for a widow, wealthy but aching with longing. In her husband's absence, tormented by unfulfilled needs. Stop right there. I knew I'd regret asking. See, it had this special crank that when rotated... Barnabas, no, enough! As you command, Your Majesty. But if you ever get the urge to see it, I have the prototype still tucked away in my trunk. A device created to satiate the lust of a wealthy widow. What would such a contraption look like, you might think? CDPR would never include a picture of said machine anywhere, right? Barnabas's Gwent card is really innocent. Look at that funny goat. But wait, what's that on the side there? Is that... No, it can't be. I'll leave this one up to you guys though. 
Did CDPR sneakily reference Barnabas' self-pleasuring contraption? Or am I seeing things and are these objects used for something else entirely? Let me know in the comment section down below. And that's the last one for today. Let me know in the comment section down below which facts you learned today and if you have any other sequence in Gwent that you want me to share with everyone, don't hesitate to let me know as well. I still have a few other easter eggs that I want to share with you, so look out for that next video and drop me a like if you enjoyed watching this one. Thank you enormously for watching and I hope to see you guys in the next episode of Gwentage. Goodbye!